Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we can wait till the end so everyone can Oh, no, let's do it there again. Yeah, okay. we, we don't need a win to do a, a, a group picture. So I just stopped the video here. I think that was will be good. This one right mine. It's it, it mine, right? <laughs> Let's see. Shall we turn it on or it's not turned on yet? Let me see. Yeah. How do you start or do I have to enable me to share my screen. Just oh, oh, I see. I'll do that now. Let me try one more time. Oh, yes. Okay. Wonderful. I don't know how much time I usually on the point of That's the part I've been most of the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just a minute, two, 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 two sure. seconds. Yeah, sure. Oh, we get one. Uh, uh, then... Yes, now both of them. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Can I have something? Yeah. I, I need to be here. Like, I need to attend this talk for class, but I also have a class at 2 30 today that's required attendance. I see. Is there any way I could take the out and stay here? Hi, hi, hi. So, yeah, let me set this up first. Here's my show. How do I do mirror? Uh, is it full screen? Okay. I think so. Um, let me double check with someone can if they, they can hear us. Um, you want to check from our side? You can check from our side, actually. But we need to make sure people are here from here, right? So okay. we need to do that. Uh, okay. Uh, what is uh, here? Okay. Hey, uh, Masa, can you hear us? Hi, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear you very well. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Minimize this. Yeah, here like this. Uh, this is the first slide, right? Yeah, first slide. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, maybe we just wait. Uh, wait, maybe sure. a few, a few minutes. Yeah. They are ready. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe we wait maybe one or two minutes. A few minutes, uh, wait a few minutes. Yeah. Your benches have a pointer? Yeah, I have one. Cool.
Yeah. Today is not nice. You have a USB, right? Yes, USB. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yes. Thank you. Oh, I mean, you're fine. Our point was you're fine. 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 Oh, uh, I think um, maybe we can get started. Uh, all right it's uh two minutes after two so let's get started uh thank you all uh coming here in person and thank you all uh doing online uh today is our pleasure to have uh professor uh Zeran wang uh, give us a talk about uh Mobility digital twin for connected and automated vehicles. Uh, so first, I want to introduce myself a little bit. So I'm a, I'm a system professor from uh, industrial engineering. Uh, I work on robotics, uh, soft robotics and robotic manipulation. Today is our pleasure to have Professor Wang here. Uh, professor Wang, he is a, a new assistant professor from civil engineering. Uh, I think he joined uh, July. July, yes. July, yeah. A very new uh, professor here, and. Uh, uh, he worked as a principal uh, researcher at the Toyota Motor uh, North America and D in Silicon Valley. I mean, before he came here, and he lead he he was leading the digital twin roadmap at the Toyota. Uh, and now, um, Professor Wang he is uh, serving as a social edit of actual transaction of intelligent vehicles and uh, the SAE Journal of uh, Connected and Automated Vehicles, and also uh, Frontiers in uh, Sustainable City Urban Transportation System and Mobility. And he is a founding, uh, he's a founding chair of the IEEE Technical Committee on uh, Internet of Things in Intelligent Transportation System. Uh, he's the author of uh, more than 40 peer-reviewed publications and 50 plus patent applications. Uh, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Wang. What is use? Thank you, thank you. And I'll um, stay in front of my camera just to make sure everyone online can hear me and, and see me well. Um, thank you and Shao Chai for organizing this wonderful event. I mean, it's really a great place for us to kind of share our research updates and hopefully to bridge some of the gaps across all different uh, disciplines of engineering and research. So again, my name is Yan Wang, and I will introduce a little bit about my previous research and my current research about mobile digital twin for connected on your vehicles. And uh, I always like to start my presentation with this video and probably some of you might recognize this. Uh, it's from uh, you know one of the previous uh, Oscar nominated movies, La La Land. Um, you know, it's their opening scene and it's actually the center of Los Angeles. You can see actually on the video, that's downtown Los Angeles. But the point I wanna make is, are these people really happy about our mobility systems? Are they really, you know, able to dance and uh, sing uh, in a pick car like this, stuck in traffic and, and you know, enjoy their time? Not necessarily, right? When I was spending six, seven years in California, this is kind of the routine. So right now I really enjoy my daily commute because there's no traffic. But the key point is all those different traffic congestion and sometimes traffic collision will introduce a lot of issues in our transportation systems and to our society. So how do we solve that? Connect an automated vehicle might be one approach, which I will introduce a little bit. So what are connected automated vehicles? Um, we have this concept autonomous vehicle or automated vehicle is a more popular domain that many people are working on right now. Uh, so those are vehicles that have their sensors, perception sensors, camera, radar, LIDAR, 
that can sense their surrounding traffic information and then make decisions by them own uh, by themselves. So those are automated vehicle or autonomous vehicles. Connected vehicle, on the other hand, they have communication module, they have wireless communication, which enable them to share the information with others and then do cooperative maneuvers together. So connected automated vehicle really leverage these two things together. So they can be driven by themselves. They can also share the information with others so they can do cool stuff, right? If you look at the, uh, the picture on the right-hand side, that's how we envision the future mobility system will be. Those vehicles, they can be traveling a platoon. They can be talking with the infrastructure, with the roadside, with the intersection uh, signals. They can also you know, communicate with the edge servers on the building and then with the bus, with the, the train station, with satellite and things like that. So everything will be connected with this whole emergence of IoT technologies, right? Inter Internet of things. So we, our goal or my goal is to develop CV technology in the future mobility system to really benefit our society as a whole. Not just benefit our transportation systems, but benefit our society as a whole to bridge the gap between different you know, diversity of uh, people, their backgrounds and where they live. It doesn't really matter, right? If we can have a more advanced transportation or mobility approaches to bridge their differences. So my talk, there are actually two subtitles, right? One about kinetic automated vehicles, one about digital twin. And a lot of people have been hearing about this buzzword very recently and, and they ask, what are they, right? What are digital twins? Where does it come from? And why do we have to care about it? So by definition, a uh, digital twin is a digital replica in cyber world of a real entity in operation in physical world. So it's actually not a new concept. It has been there for more than a decade when I think around 2008 or 2009, uh, NASA kind of proposed this idea in one of their proposals to build digital twins or digital models, if you will, of their aircraft engines to monitor uh, their aircrafts in real time since it might be very difficult or costly to kind of uh, monitor those real entities because they are on, uh, on the air, in the air, right? So they build digital models, they build digital twins to kind of get data from their sensors and then do predictive maintenance, do predictive analytics based on all those different models that they got. And then it's all those different other companies like Siemens or uh, General Electric uh, who have, you know, go into this space and, and buy in this concept and applying that to manufacturing, right? They also build digital things for their manufacturing plants, uh, get sensors from all those different uh, parts in, the, uh, in their factory and then build digital twins. And those are the things that I actually just searched online, I think back in May and June. So there is this new buzzword about metaverse, right? A lot of people talking about that, especially after Facebook last year announced their, their name changed because metaverse. Um, and more people uh, in the public, they are combining these two terms together, digital twins and metaverse. And they all think digital twins is a enabling technology for metaverse, uh, will enable a lot of different possibilities to do simulation, do virtual prototyping for metaverse. So, it's really getting to public, uh, their visions, uh, and more, more and more people, they are interested in this whole concept. Uh, we are not just buying this concept as just to show off that, you know, it's a new bus or things like that. But uh, when I was at Toyota uh, and I was leading this project and we have been working on this since 2016. So it's already six years, uh, long before this, this whole concept becomes this proper right now. Uh, and we have a lot of different achievements, which I can show uh, during this talk briefly. And this is from one of the, the papers that uh, we published earlier this year, kind of comparing the difference between digital twin and two other very similar concepts. One is iteration and one is model-based design. So iteration for the subplot A, uh, those are the things that the, conver the, the convergence is commonly used to switch back and forth between the physical and digital basis. So if you look at this one, you have physical tests, you have digital tests, you kind of do tuning back and forth, back and forth to ensure, okay, convergence apply between your digital part and your physical part. 
So that's iteration. Model based, model based design is actually a more confusing term compared to digital twin. So model based design often starts digital and incrementally swaps in physical components. And that's really the way that we are currently doing for a lot of research. We build a model, we build a equation, algorithm, whatever that is. Uh, we test that in simulation, numerical simulation, and then we go on the real vehicle to go on the real hardware to test that out for, I don't know, a week or, or a month. And then we find out, okay, this week's testing results might not be promising. We go back to our lab, go back to our numerical simulation, change some parameters of our algorithms, and then you know, go to the physical part again to do you know, uh, hardware you know, loop test, things like that. So it's a, a long time cycle, if you will. Digital twins, on the other hand, the major difference is they actually maintain synchronized version between their physical parts and their real parts uh, and their digital parts. Means digital twins, they have to be real time synchronized with their physical entities. They have to get real time data from the physical entities. And then this whole loop, they're running in real time. So it's not like a week, a month or something, but it has to be in milliseconds. So your digital twin has to be high fidelity, has to get real time synchronized, uh, synchronized data from your real entities. So that's really, you know, the difference that we envision uh, between digital twins and others. And many people, they have their own opinions. So for this talk, I will briefly touch on uh, how we propose this whole concept of mobility digital twin. We deploy this digital twin concept to the field of mobility, transportation systems in particular, for three different periods. One for traffic, one for a vehicle, and one for driver. So it's, it's a busy diagram, I know, but for if you look at the upper part is digital space, lower part is the physical space. So all those different yellow parts, th those are real entities. You have different sensors on your vehicle, you have drivers, um, and we sample the data from all those different parts, send the data to digital space, where on digital space, we have built different digital twins to do different microservices. And if you look at the, these modules, so for the physical space, they will be in charge of sampling data. They will actuating the commands from the digital twin. So it's, if we consider it as a, this as an end-to-end system, then the physical part will be at the both ends, right? Getting data actuation. But what's in between is really uh, what our digital twin does. Uh, we storage the data, we conduct simulation, we, we build a model for all the data that we get. Uh, we conduct machine learning, um, and then we make prediction based on all those algorithms. So for the first part, I will briefly touch on uh, how this whole system works for traffic. And uh, you know, if you look at these two videos, the video on the left was actually filmed by me three years ago already. Uh, when I was driving to my work uh, in the Bay Area and I was stuck in traffic. And this is a ramp merging scenario where there was actually no ramp metering. So there was no traffic signal, but everyone is just queuing up because the, the mainline traffic, they're just traveling too fast and they don't have the, they have the right of way, right? They don't have to show courtesy. Uh, they don't have to yield to you. Uh, they can just travel how, how fast they want. But for us from the ramp, it's really risky to make the decision to conduct a ramp merge or lane change because otherwise you might have something like the, the right video shows, right? You get sandwiched by two giant trucks or by some other vehicles. Uh, they have the right of way. So if you get sandwiched by them, uh, it's your fault. Right? So how do we uh, apply advanced vehicle technology to address this kind of dangerous situation? Because it's happening every day, um, especially in places like California have so many traffic going on and those vehicles are traveling very fast. They don't, they're not as polite as, uh, as people are here, right? So how do you address all those? So we apply this whole concept of digital twin um, and we assume all those vehicles, they have connectivity, they can talk with each other. Where you see we have, for example, six vehicles, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, what if we project a vehicle's information um, as their digital twins to the vehicle on the other land. What if for my vehicle four, I project my preceding vehicle three, that vehicle's speed, position, acceleration to my land, so I can know, okay, it's better for me to 
decelerate a little bit ahead of time or accelerate a little bit ahead of time or things like that to adjust my position, adjust my speed with that vehicle. And then we can make the decision, conduct the behavior even before we go to that conflict zone. So we do things cooperatively in advance and then we conduct a safe merging, a smooth merging without any collision. So this is the only technical uh, you know, the slide I provided for, for this talk. So uh, we proposed a distributed consensus-based algorithm, and this algorithm was actually from the robotics domain, where a group of robot, uh, robots, they converge to a consensus at a certain place. In this case, we actually reduce this algorithm from a three-dimensional uh, space to one-dimensional space, where those vehicles are just traveling longitudinal, right? They just follow each other, and we want to reach the consensus between two vehicles regarding their position, regarding their velocity, right? Uh, if we consider uh, vehicle I is our uh, eagle vehicle, vehicle J is my precision vehicle, then I want our distance between two vehicles to maintain a certain consensus, a certain gap, and our velocity to converge to the same. So uh, the, this term will just stand for our, the, you know, the final convergence means our speed are the same. And there is a damping gain, which is calculated uh, by a lookup table to kind of guarantee, okay, it's safe, it's smooth. Uh, we can reach the consensus um, in a more efficient manner, things like that. So this is how it looks like in video, uh, in simulation, where we provided a uh, game engine called Unity to conduct the simulation. If you look at the, those mainline vehicles, they actually break up earlier before those vehicles see you, right? Because before the vehicle sees this uh, Eagle vehicle, uh, this red vehicle. So you see, um, you know, the second vehicle on the main line, once it identifies, okay, there is a vehicle trying to merge in front of me based on our algorithm, I would just decelerate a little bit ahead of time to show some courtesy to create this gap for that vehicle. So once we actually are both at the merging zone, the conflict zone, we can just conduct a safe and smooth lane change, right? Everyone's happy. We don't have to make late decision, dangerous, risky decision, things like that. Yeah. And how this is calculated, we also have a planning or a kind of uh, scheduling algorithm to calculate their sequence of merging, right? For this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they will apply that consensus algorithm to apply and to calculate their speed. So they can merge in a safe manner, a smooth manner. Uh, we also did this with human loop simulation, and this was uh, conducted by some of uh, the students at UC Riverside. Uh, where you know, students driving in a simulator and test that in a simulation, and then we deploy that on the real vehicle. We deploy that on three Toyota Corollas, where the, all those vehicles, they are talking with the cloud server. They share their information, their speed, position, acceleration with the cloud server in real time. Um, and then they are able to, as, as you can see from the video, the second vehicle is able to decelerate a little bit ahead of time uh, to show some courtesy to its driver. And how we did this is by digital twin, right? As I said earlier, if you look at this uh, upper left part, those are the digital twin or virtual representations of vehicles that are traveling in real time. Um, and for this case, those are actually not automated vehicles. Those are human driven vehicles. And we designed this human machine interface to show the speed to the driver, say uh, the left number is your current speed. The right number is the suggested speed calculated by the consensus algorithm. Uh, what you need to do as a driver is to just control your paddles to track that speed. So you will be behaving more like a robotic driver because um, um, we don't have automated vehicle at that time. So we act drivers to act as robotic driver by showing their guidance based on the algorithm that we just provided. Um, so this whole case showcases that our algorithm, our digital twin concept can smooth the traffic, can increase the traffic throughput, and also a side product is to decrease the energy consumption, right? Yeah, uh, you, you might need to like, uh, ask questions now or if, what you prefer, but ask questions later. So. Probably save until the end, right? Okay. If, it's, if it's easier. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. So because we have some questions on the chat, you can ask later. Sure, sure, thank you. Um, and uh, so this case, like to address the traffic issues, right? We uh, reduce energy consumption, we improve the traffic throughput, and uh, also address the safety to some extent. 
So the second pillar is vehicle digital twin, where we apply this to individual vehicles um, and to provide guidance to different drivers based on you know, the data that we get sampled from different vehicles. And I will use this example, um, adaptive boost control. I'm not sure whether um, any of you have used that on your vehicle. Uh, it's pretty standard on the new models right now where you just switch on the button on your steering wheel. Uh, the radar on your vehicle will sense the distance between your front bumper of your vehicle and the rear bumper of your precision vehicle, uh, the distance in between, the relative uh, speed uh, difference as well. So your vehicle will maintain a certain gap uh, between two vehicles. And then if there's no vehicle in front of you, then your vehicle will act um, as the regular cruise control, old fashioned cruise control to cruise at the speed that you set. Um, and we change the settings by the steering wheel, uh, as I show here, by press those buttons. So I put a video right here on the right, which was actually filmed by me earlier this year, exactly the, the day when I came to uh, Purdue campus for my interview. Um, so I rented a Toyota Camry from the airport. I was just playing around with the ACC settings on the vehicle. Uh, so you see, I'm following that vehicle. Uh, there are three bars, means my distance between my uh, Eagle vehicle and Pacific vehicle is far. I change it to two bars, means it's medium. I can change to one bar, means it's short, right? You can toggle through the settings on my steering wheel to you know, adjust this, the vehicles based on my preferences. But a lot of times people, because we get complaints actually when us at Toyota, we get complaints from our dealership, from our Toyota customers saying that it's not personalized. You claim that as a automated vehicle feature, but why do you still have to change all the settings as human being, right? Why don't the vehicle just drive by themselves, uh, adjust in different traffic condition, and I can just monitor them. I don't have to change every now and then based on different situations. We did a survey and this is how it turns out, right? A lot of people, they change the settings for the specific functionality of ACC. And if we ask them how often do they change the settings, 69%, uh, almost 70% of the people, they said they change the settings multiple times during a single trip. Means uh, today I was driving, I was also on my vehicle. I switched on ACC. I think I counted, I changed like seven times for the settings. Sometimes there's a truck in front of me. I want to stay further because I want to be on the safer side. Sometimes I want to stay closer because there is a vehicle trying to cut in. So I, I change the setting one more time. Sometimes the speed limit changes. I change the speed uh, settings as well. And we asked all those different users of this product. They said exactly what, as what I said, right? Traffic condition, that's a major factor. 43% uh, of people, they change the settings because the traffic changes. And 27% of people, they change because weather changes. If it's a sunny weather, versus it's a foggy weather, rainy weather, right? Your settings can be different. Road type, if you're driving here in Midwest compared to if you're driving in Manhattan, right? It's definitely different. Personal mood. I was, at, I was actually rushing to a meeting yesterday. So I changed the setting to short car falling, 90 miles per hour, uh, which is high, I know, but I just want to rush to the meeting. But after I finished my work, when I was driving to my home, I can change to pretty relaxed setting, right? 65 miles per hour, um, you know, long car falling settings, things like that. But the key concept is all those different ADAS system, right? We call it partially automated driving system. They still require a lot of inputs from drivers, from the users, and those are not really automated. So what we want to do here is we want to do it by a personalized way. Want to learn from drivers their behaviors. Uh, say in the morning, you drive your vehicle, you generate a lot of data. We then sample all this data, your personalized data, send that to a cloud. So on the cloud, we build digital twins. We build your driver type digital twin, your vehicle type, your weather type digital twin, things like that. So we classify, okay, this specific data set is from an aggressive driver like you uh, and driving an SUV, um, a Toyota Highlander or whatever. Uh, in a sunny weather in the uh, 465 northbound here. So we then apply machine learning models. Uh, in this case, we use different models, which I will introduce later, to nerf on your driving behaviors. And then to replicate what you actually do 
in different traffic scenarios. And then in the real time, say next time we switch on your setting, then that system, the model will be applied to you and the system will be personalized. We'll understand whatever that you prefer to do, whatever that you want to follow your preceding vehicle or your speed, things like that. And then this whole system is a personalized adaptive boost control, which learns from your behavior and doesn't require you to do more inputs to the system. Um, some details that we have implemented, we have implemented a Gaussian process algorithm uh, to kind of conduct as an imitation learning. We imitate exactly what the driver did and then has some good results, which I won't uh, dive into details. And then we also tried on this inverse reinforcement learning algorithm, which is more useful because we can recover the personalized reward for different drivers and then kind of predict their behaviors under different driver type, weather type, and then use that for their future references. And if you look at the results uh, on the bottom part, you can see this whole system reduced the takeover rate from the drivers on the system. Means once we nerf on the driver behavior, you switch on the algorithm, then drivers, they actually trust more on the vehicle. They tend to take over less, right? I'm fully 100% trusting this vehicle means I don't mess around with the settings because the system can just adjust to my preferences based on different scenarios. And that's how we want to achieve in the future, right? We don't want frequent takeovers from the driver. We want the system to behave as best or as precise as the driver wants. So this is uh, some simulation that we did, uh, human in loop simulation. Uh, we have been working, so Toyota, uh, I mean, I, I mean, we, I, I mean, Toyota has been working from home for three years. So I was actually driving in my uh, bedroom, uh, wearing my pajama, but it's populating data from the simulation to a cloud and where we visualize all this cloud um, at, on AWS through a web portal. So you can navigate through different settings, different user profile, different weather profile, different driver type and, and vehicle type and things like that. And you also have your score. Uh, so this is just to indicate that we have digital twins that are, that are deployed on a cloud that can track all those data that you generate every day and then provide guidance next, next time we switch on a service. Um, we also did real world vehicle experiment where we collect data from uh, different places. And, and those are the places where Toyota has uh, branches, uh, Southern California, uh, Bay Area and Michigan, where we use a prototype vehicle uh, shipped directly from, from Japan. Actually, it was very expensive uh, as a shipping cost. Uh, it's a Lexus uh, LC, or LS, I bet, um, where we kind of mess around with this controller to enable us to tap into the controller to change the low level uh, drive by wire system to input our algorithm. Uh, parameters and then learn from the driver's behaviors and then change the settings for the adaptive boost control. So we were testing um, after the system got implemented. Uh, this is one of my colleagues driving that, uh, which already switched on the personalized ACC. So he was just testing, okay, whether I'm trusting this system, whether it learns from my previous behaviors uh, or not, right? Uh, we also tried that in Michigan, and this was actually our vice president you know, kind of testing our demo. And it turned out our, executive, our executives, they, they really like this concept, although it's pretty simplified concept, but uh, they bought in this concept. Um, so the, the plan right now is actually to deploy this whole thing, personalized adaptive cruise control in the next version of Toyota and Lexus vehicles globally, so which will be 2024, 2025, things like that. And that will be based on our, our algorithms. So, uh, digital twin, they reduce the takeover rate by um, 90%, more than 90%. And that's by experiment. Uh, but the key concept is we increase the driver's trust on automated vehicles by digital twins. So the last part, last Peter that I want to briefly introduce is human digital twin. So we talk about traffic, we talk about vehicle, but uh, you know when we talk about automated vehicle, we're really missing a key concept, a, a missing a key component, which is human, right? A lot of industry players right now, they're talking about autonomous driving, they're talking about all these different fancy technologies, but they ignore humans' role in that. Uh, they, they don't care about 
their preferences. They don't care about whether they feel comfortable on that or not. Uh, but here we want to predict human beings, their behaviors, and then satisfy you know, their preferences, exactly like what I showed earlier, but this is more based on their behavior prediction. Um, a bit of that I went, but the key concept here is we nerve front drivers different behaviors. We uh, cluster them into different types. Then we adopt some machine learning models to predict their behaviors in advance to allow other vehicles to kind of be informed and be uh, safer driving, things like that. Uh, we verify that in simulation, in real vehicle, and the result is we can predict their lane change prediction, a lane change decision in advance. So if a driver wants to conduct a lane change, instead of waiting until they turn on the turning signal, where a lot of people, they don't, we actually, based on the algorithm, predict their decision three seconds beforehand. So it's better for surrounding vehicles to make decisions to, to either sh uh, show some courtesy or just driving uh, without any hesitation. And I, I'll just provide some of the details uh, on this slide. We first cluster different data. Uh, we collect data and we cluster data by DB scan. Uh, we use LSTM to conduct land change decision prediction. Uh, then we recover the different drivers, their lane change preferences by cost functions, and then make predictions, whether they are changing the lane, whether they are not changing the lane, things like that. So this is a code simulation platform that we built where we have a game engine, which I just showed earlier multiple times, combined with the traffic simulator. So the traffic simulator, Sumo, uh, will provide all this real world traffic flow uh, or realistic traffic flow. And these two uh, systems, they are connected in real time through TCP IP uh, to enable the, uh, the communication, to enable all those data to be transmitted. Um, and we also break the boundary between our simulation with AWS, as I showed earlier as well, which is one of the first works in our research area that really deploy all those things on the cloud. So it's not just running on your local machine, but we leverage cloud computing to kind of store which some data to uh, use some of the microservices provided by Amazon um, and uh, uh, you know to provide guidance to different drivers. So this is a demo which I can pre uh, very briefly play where it's not playing because it's a uh, YouTube video. Okay. If it's not playing, oh, okay, there we go. Um, and that, this was uh, based on the ICRA paper uh, last year, I think, or presented this year in Philadelphia. So the case is our vehicle uh, is predicted in real time by its lane change possibility with all this algorithm that show. In this case, this vehicle is just driving through um, and this algorithm is calculated based on not just real time data, but historic data that we collected from this specific driver. Um, and those historic data and real time data are combined to build the digital twins for this driver. And then that digital twin will be used to predict its lane change possibility. So you see this case, before this lane change actually happened, the uh, possibility already changed from 30 some percent to 56 or I don't remember 6%, which can enable the drivers on Ireland to, to be aware. This is a real world case where we are the Eagle vehicle. We see that vehicle has, say, in this case, a possibility of lane change already reached 60, 70% before that vehicle actually be, uh, turned on the turning signal. So I will be more aware of that vehicle and then I can just you know, have some deceleration to create a gap for that vehicle to merge in. Same case here, uh, that vehicle has a lane change possibility changes. Uh, before the vehicle actually be, uh, conduct the lane change. And that will be based on the digital twin that we build for all these different vehicles. Um, this is the virtualization, a uh, visualization of digital twins um, where uh, it's actually from the cloud view, right? We visualize this on the data uh, that we store on the cloud where you can see different cases, the possibility will change uh, differently. And a key thing that I wanna point out here uh, which might be easily missing is that if you look at all those different email addresses, those are not just email address. Those are their user ID of their digital twins. So for each of the driver, 
they have their personalized token, if you will, to the cloud server. And then we're able to request their historic data, request their models or their digital twins based on this email address, based on their token. So for surrounding vehicles, they just request data from the cloud, conduct prediction, and then uh, you know, make their decisions accordingly. So I hope uh, um, those three cases are uh, not too overwhelming because we have done a lot of work and you know get precise, um, uh, precisely uh, and and uh, you know compressed into a, a short talk like this. But uh, you know the key concept is for this whole framework, we can enable a lot of different microservices for traffic, vehicle, and human beings. And my plan here at Purdue is actually to further expand not just limited to transportation, to mobility, but to some other domains, manufacturing, healthcare, uh, you name it, which can leverage this whole framework to collect data, sample data, do all those different five things, and then make actuation back to the real world. Um, and we think this will be definitely the future uh, for server physical systems or internet of things. Um, and we, this is uh, you know, a brief uh, illustration of how we deploy this. So we're not just talking about the buzzword of digital twin. We de actually deploy this on AWS, leveraging a lot of different existing services. And also we build an edge layer. So it's not just a cloud layer. We also have an edge layer to handle some of the you know, offline processing, to handle some of the data uh, storage, because we don't want to offload all this data to the cloud, right? It's costly. It's not that uh, you know, guaranteeing that the time, uh, real time is hard. So we also have an edge layer. I will also build API layer to connect this whole framework with external uh, navigation data, map data, weather data, and things like that. Uh, so last slide is about the challenges. Uh, we talk about digital twins, a lot of different possibilities, a lot of different uh, new opportunities, but there are a lot of challenges as well. Uh, and we summarize some of them here. Uh, first is the standardization. So right now there is not even a, single definition of digital twin. A lot of people, they have their own understanding of digital twin, um, but there are more attentions from both academia and industry, right? I just list some of the big players uh, in digital twin um, and especially NVIDIA, they have their very fancy digital twin called Omniverse. Uh, so it's a virtual environment that they build for different factories, um, but there's no definition, let alone any standardization, right? Uh, so, and consensus is really hard to reach. Uh, when we talk about digital twin, what we are talking about, what communication method we should use, how do we store data, how do we transmit the data, still unclear. Uh, but you know, there are some efforts in the man manufacturing domain that they put some put together some standards for digital twin in manufacturing. But hopefully, there will be something in the transportation domain as well. Public cloud versus private cloud. We in this case we use public cloud because Toyota was collaborating with AWS. Uh, and which is good at scalability, reliability, affordability, right? But it gives away the control. You, you essentially just give us away a lot of data, a lot of different algorithms to a third party, right? It's not in-house anymore. If we do private cloud, it's more secure, it's more flexible, but it's less reliable, right? What if something goes wrong? You don't have a full team of people that are standby on call, right? Uh, you have to wait until uh, some expert to fix that issue. So probably this mobility digital twin and any other digital twins, they can be deployed on a hybrid approach, right? On either public cloud, private cloud, or you know, some part on public cloud, some part on private cloud. Data requirements. As I said, real-time synchronization of high frequency data is very necessary to have a real, real digital twin, right? You, you gotta have your digital twins getting data from the real world, but it's hard. A lot of times you have communication issues, you have some other issues that you don't have access to the cloud, to your digital world. Um, and how do you guarantee safety? How do you guarantee the security, right? When you transmit all this raw data, uh, the data from your vehicle, those camera data, those LiDAR data, then you give away your own privacy, right? That the vehicle will know where you are living at, uh, what's your preference, which is your preferred, uh, grocery store, or gas station, things like that. So we are actually working on federal learning approaches where we conduct some of the machine learning approaches. We process data on the vehicle, on the edge. And instead of sharing the raw data, we share the parameters. 
we share the nerd model parameters to the cloud to other parties. So it's kind of encoded that cannot be decoded by some others, but can only be decoded by the experts, by the things that we know. Um, and in this case, privacy can be procured and uh, can be uh, secured. And also we can um, you know, reduce the, the bandwidth or cost requirements and things like that. So again, a lot of different challenges, uh, but uh, we are pretty promising for the future of Digital Twin. And that summarized my talk. Um, thank you very much for attending here. Thank you. Yeah, we already have a few questions uh, online. I hope we have more welcome questions here. Um, let's take a first question from online. Uh, so, Zhe uh, Hui, you are you here? Maybe even Bradley Austin. Zhe uh, Hui, are you here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please ask your question directly. Yeah. So yeah, so I'm curious about the cloud communication bandwidth for sharing this feature between in your first uh, part of presentation. Sure, uh, so uh, so we was asking about the bandwidth for sharing the information uh, through the real world and digital twins, right? For the uh, RAM merging, I assume? Yeah, yeah, probably around page 12 or 11. 12 or 11, yeah, cool. Uh, let me go back to uh, this one, right, right, right here. Yes, good question. So. I, I missed this part uh, because, you know, again, it's a, a very uh, compressed presentation. In this case, there's, there's actually some fact I want to share. One is the data that we are, uh, you know, transmitting across different vehicles. Those are just very simplified digits of uh, numbers, like uh, their speed, their position, their acceleration. So we're not transmitting any of the perception data, meaning we are not transmitting any com uh, camera data or any LiDAR data, any radar data, it's all those different packages of small numbers, flow numbers, if you will. Um, and that's one fact. The second fact is uh, we have, uh, we are using cellular-based uh, communication here. We use 4G LTE to communicate through different vehicles uh, and uh, with the cloud. And our performance is quite, uh, quite good. It's okay. Um, where we have end-to-end -end delay of 80 millisecond, means from one vehicle to the cloud to the other vehicle, the average end-to-end -end delay is 80 millisecond. And in this case, it's you know based on 4G LTE, uh, but still we are transmitting very small data packages. But if we're talking about transmitting camera data or LiDAR data, in, then in this case, uh, it might not be that feasible to conduct real-time communications uh, for applications like this. Hope I answer your question. Yeah, got it. Yeah, so uh, I assume uh, so. Basically, the data is like uh, kinematics uh, information. Yes, yes. But uh, is is it include uh, any? Uh, I would say the the shape of the the car or no the, the, no nope no. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Maybe next question go to online. Um, participant here. Do we have a question here? Uh, yes. Um. Is there any concern with the personalized usage of the cruise control where, you know, there's mainly focus on what they're actually doing? Um, because that's one of the, you know, challenges with the current strategy that I feel, and we should replace most of the system, right? But as one understood, I that the cruise control is supposed to be the most simplified version of that. Mm -hmm. um, so wouldn't there be some problem with uh, the driver using focus? Yeah, the, the question just, uh repeat for the online folks. Uh, the question was for a personalized adaptive cruise control or adaptive cruise control in general, whether there might be uh, some issues of distracting to the drivers. Uh, the drivers might lose focus on the vehicle or on the traffic scenario. This was right on point. I was actually just writing this uh, paragraph uh, before I come here in my office about future, uh, you know, we call it meta empowered ADAS or, uh, you know, next version of ADAS or automated driving that might you know, introduce a lot of distraction to the driver because we are essentially talking about more information, right? It might overwhelm the driver with too many information uh, on the windshield, on the steering wheel, on, on everywhere. So our concept here is actually to simplify the things, right? If we can learn from the driver's behaviors, we just take off all those buttons. Uh, you just press one button, adaptive cruise control. That's it, right? It learns from uh, whatever your behavior is. 
but still, uh, it's a huge problem for uh, sound drivers that are not experienced. Uh, Professor Shao Shai, Mo, and, and myself, we actually put together a, uh, a proposal earlier that we want to nerf on the takeover uh, readiness from the driver. With the driver, they are always ready to take over from the vehicle in case the automated driving system may break down in some corner cases. Whether a driver is always stay focused on the road, can take over from the steering wheel in five seconds or so. And that's really hard uh, for different drivers. Some drivers, they are always focused. Some drivers, including myself, I tend to over trust my vehicle. It's a Lexus vehicle. And then I just you know relax and sometimes I check my phone, sometimes I check my email. I have to put one of my hands on the steering wheel because that's required, but still I can do a lot of other things. So it's, it's a hard question uh, and it, it really introduced a lot of um, collisions, crashes on the road. Cool. Thanks. Uh, next question, maybe online. 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 Oh, oh, oh. Jolie, Jolie, are you here? Jolie, are you here? Okay, then um, we go to uh, uh, I think Tian Yi. Tian Yi have a question online, right? Tian Yi, are you here? Yes. Uh, yeah, please continue. Please your question. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the inspiring talk. Um, like I'm from a HCI, a human computer interaction background, and this is really inspiring. And I'm particularly interested in the human digital twin idea. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit more details about how you did user modeling or what data you uh, collect from the drivers and how you collect that data. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tanya, for this question. It's actually an another right on point question. I was just talking with my students yesterday. We should put together a specific paper about human digital twin. So not just focus on uh, you know, transportation use cases, but more general, right? Because uh, a lot of people, they are, uh, in healthcare domain, they also talk about human digital twins for conducting healthcare applications uh, to predict their uh, potential diseases, things like that. So in this case, in our case, human digital twin, we are thinking of three layers. So what I show here in the presentation, that was actually from our very earlier research, uh, where we just focus on the first layer, getting data from the vehicle. So getting data from the vehicle means uh, if one driver, uh, you know, changing their lane or changing their speed, then their input to the system, to the vehicle will be a steering wheel and the paddles, the, the gas pedal, the brake pedal. We get all those, all those and then uh, model their behaviors and build their digital twins. That's the first layer. Uh, the second layer, we just submitted another IPRA paper uh, last month where we install in-cabin monitoring data. We, we install in-cabin monitoring in cabin monitoring camera, a camera to kind of get uh, drivers their uh, head position, their eye gaze tracking information to see whether they are focused on the road ahead, whether they change their head to the left, uh, uh, if they want to conduct a lane change, things like that. So that's the second layer. The third layer is to still use that, but the same source, but to conduct emotion recognition analysis. Want to see whether the driver is happy, the driver is exhausted, whether the driver is uh, very angry, things like that. So we can also model their behavior. So that's those three layers. The fourth layer, uh, which will be probably further in the future, is by some wearable devices, right? If they, they wear their smartwatch, we can monitor their heart rate. We can monitor their ECG if it's a very advanced smartwatch and, and to monitor their health uh, status conditions and then further build the human digital twins. So it's really multiple layers of uh, sources. Um, and then the more data sources that we have, then the more complicated, the more useful that the human digital twins will be. Wonderful. So uh, I saw we have more questions here. Yeah. Uh, so the first section for the GS Creative Transition, I have a very uh, large question. Uh, for the case of the uh, run merging uh, hybrid, so can I just do this? Uh, all the vehicles just use vehicle to day to communicate with each other. And then you use common filter for the prediction. Mm -hmm. And the new new kind of try to you, you can use a prediction to do the mm -hmm. uh, without the mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question. Uh Actually, the traditional way here is to use V2V communication or V2I2V, right? Vehicle to infrastructure to vehicle. Uh, they don't necessarily use a cloud uh, server over there. Uh, our concept here is if you use real-time communication like that, V2V, DSRC, essentially, 
you only get their real time information. You only get where they are right now, how they behave right now, but you don't get their historical data. You don't know how they behave historically in the same scenario. So probably if we leverage cloud server, we'll leverage the, the, the digital twins that were built on the cloud, we identify, okay, Hussein, you are driving here, and this is how you behave in this specific ramp here. And we know, okay, that's your routine. It's better for us to build our model and then predict your behavior. So it's uh, really leverage the historical data that we have on the cloud and then the models that we store on the cloud. So it's a little bit different. It's more informative than real time V2V, V2I communication. Yeah. So we do not need to get more information. Correct. You know, what is the top price or the better or yep. decelerated to the risk? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Oh, I think we have more questions here. Yeah. So we are talking in the previous part when we talked about uh, the human visual model mm -hmm. and pretty much data we had from the front end to this and how they would respond. Um, it seems to me like the underlying assumption in these projects would be that the, all these really vehicles will be connected mm -hmm. and everything will be like, like we're working for this uh, really company. Mm -hmm. <coughs> will this be able to apply to other vehicles? So I understand all this, all this different observation and surveillance on this person that would have to be a personal choice mm -hmm. to choose to participate in this kind of human vehicle model. Mm -hmm. If someone chooses not to participate, but they're in an older vehicle, will this person still be able to work with that kind of vehicle and be able to maintain safety if the other vehicle is not connected to the rest of the team? Yeah, just repeat this question very precise, uh, concisely to, to the online folks. So the question was really about the penetration rate, right? What if the market penetration rate is not that high? Some vehicles, they are not connected vehicle. They are not willing to share their data. How do we build digital twins for them? And the answer is uh, we can you know, leverage some of the other sensors um, or le leverage some of the other data sources. Say we have CAV, connected automated vehicle. We claim that as sensor-rich vehicle. So they actually serve as a data hub. For surrounding vehicles, even if you guys are driving conventional old fashioned cars, based on the sensors on my vehicle, based on the camera on my vehicle, I can sense your behaviors for, say I follow you for a minute or so. Then I kind of identify you as a certain type of driver, which is similar to on the cloud, those driver drives. Say you drive in a certain way, you drive very constant speed, things like that. Based on this data that I collected from you during this short period, I then classify you to a certain type of driver. Now I leverage all those data that I have on the cloud to predict your behaviors. So that necessarily to be whether you are willing to share data, it's great that, that you are willing to share, but if not, we can then classify you to some other data, some other models that we have already and predict your behaviors. So that's our story. Uh, it's, I'm not sure whether it's feasible, but that's how we envision the future will be. Yeah. Wonderful. So, uh, next question, maybe I'm going to ask uh, uh, for Jordi on, on his behalf. He can't speak now, so I he have a question here. Uh, so his question is like this. Uh, the concepts of digital twin are new to me, and I was wondering what is the essential computational resource and software are required to build our own digital twin model for our project? Good question, um, tough question. Uh, this is, uh, again, I just flashed this slide earlier um, at the end of the presentation. This, this was Toyota's approach, uh, or specifically Toyota Infotech Labs, which was where I worked for uh, their approach of deploying digital twins. Um, and it's on public cloud. Uh, I mean, a lot of people, again, uh, there are a lot of confusion about digital twins. Some people claim their simulation environment is a digital twin, uh, which is a very simplified understanding of that. Uh, if you uh, just have a simulation environment, you get your environment getting data from the real world, uh, somehow you can claim that as a digital twin. But uh, our understanding digital twin, in, in order to have a digital twin, you have to deploy this multiple layer framework where your digital space is able to collect data, to sample data from the physical space in real time. Um, in this uh, figure, we have device layers. So those are the physical space components but we really have those connections in this figure, those real-time connections. Those are TCP IP or MQTT communication that are transmitting data in real time to ensure that digital twins that we have in the cloud can get data, 
can can update themselves, update their models uh, very frequently. So uh, back to your question, uh, we can deploy this on some private cloud if we have some private uh, uh, cloud servers in our lab or so. Uh, we can you know do a small scale digital twin. Uh, that's no problem. I'm actually planning to do that uh, after uh, our our lab is set up. Uh, but in order to have more scalability, then probably cloud will be will be the only option. Yeah, that's that's my shallow uh, understanding. Thank you. Great. Uh, do we have more questions? Yes. Uh, well, I, I don't think you really 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 so consider your background. If you do research, do you believe in the traditional transportation media would be more critical as compared to computer scientists, for example, for this particular domain? Yeah, it's another very tough question, and I don't want to speak falsely because Darcy was sitting over there. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, let me repeat this question. So uh, this question was, uh, for this research, all those interdisciplinary research that I just showed, whether transportation engineers, they are, they are as important as computer and scientists uh, to deploy this kind of system. And my answer is definitely they are important. All those domain knowledge in transportation, like what uh, Darcy showed last during the last seminar, a lot of other, all those different technical details, I don't understand. And if I don't understand those details, how am I able to deploy systems in the application, right? So we still need to leverage a lot of existing methods, existing knowledge from transportation, traffic flow, uh, network modeling, whatever that is, to kind of getting us uh, to, the, to the pace to design our models. Otherwise, if we just consider this as a black box, we have some machine learning model end to end, fit in data, output data, then that will mess up the whole system, right? Because tra transparent system is very safety critical system. So we still should rely on traditional tra uh, transportation knowledge and then swap in some more advanced learning-based data-driven method to kind of leverage the advantages across different uh, domains, yeah. Wonderful. I think we have one more question. Yeah. yeah the Sure. Uh, very uh, concise question was whether we have, we are building on this assumption that human they will always behave the same as their digital twins. Um, and this this was actually a very good question because the personalized adaptive boost control system that I just very briefly showed two algorithms: one Gaussian processing, one inverse reinforcement learning. Uh, the reason that we have two algorithms is for the first algorithm actually we tend to overfit the, the algorithm based on their data. Means we want to know every aspect of how drivers they behave, how humans they behave. But we also, the algorithm also learns some bad behaviors. So not necessarily learn all those good behaviors, all those bad behaviors, all those speed fluctuation, all those lane change, sudden lane change, the, the system learns all that. So I think to your answer, digital twins, they, they have this potential to correct the you know the bad behaviors from human beings and then provide them guidance to say hey it's better for you to behave this way uh, because that's based on the data that we collected from other good drivers you should behave this way so not necessarily uh, humans they always behave the same as their digital twins but we think digital twins can help humans can uh, can improve their actions or their behaviors if if i answer your question yeah wonderful wonderful so uh, we are on time, so uh, if you have more questions, you are more than welcome to stay here, uh, talk with uh, Dr. Wang uh, after the uh, session here. And I think this comes the end of the uh, session today. And uh, let's uh, uh, thank, uh, thank uh, Dr. Uh, Wang for the very inspiring and uh, awesome uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No.